So I want to thank everyone for coming. Um, my name is Ashley. I'm the library director here. Um, this is my mom, Judy Kungo. Um, I asked her to come do a presentation about Windsor Court. So I lived on Windsor Court for like 20 some years before I moved away. So just across the street. Hey, just across the street. But mom has lived on Windsor Court for um, practically all my life. Yeah. Um, 60 some years. 60 some years. Yeah, moved down the street in 59 when my parents, Brad and Connie Ash, built their home. And then in 1979, when Lee and I got married, we moved into my parents' home. <laughs> so I knew that Windsor Court kind of had a fun little history um, kind of associated with it. So I asked mom to do a presentation about it. Mm -hmm. So thank you, mom, for doing this. Of course. <laughs> it's all yours. I'm going to be the pointer lady today. <laughs> Well, welcome everyone, and we're going to take a little history down Windsor Court, also a little bit about the area around Windsor Court as well. First, Windsor Court is right off Madison Avenue in the former Milton Junction um, town, and the building in the background is the former Hall and Wright Insurance Office. Yes. Windsor Court, of course, is one of the few dead-end streets in the city of Milton. And for many years before the dead-end street was actually put in up at the top of the street, many people would come down, have to turn around in our driveway, and then when um, Randy and Judy Itchery built their home up in the back corner of um, Windsor Court, of course, people didn't realize that was their long driveway. A lot of people would go up and try to turn around in their driveway. They thought Windsor Court came out on John Paul Road on the other side of the cemetery. This is a plat map of 1881, and you can see right in that area, um, yeah, right, kind of like right in that area that would be land that would someday become Windsor Court. Right. Mm -hmm. And I had a few years ago had kind of marked those areas that I knew of as um, areas on that area of Windsor or Melton Junction where the star is, that is the area that would someday become Windsor Court. Number two is um, would, what, what would represent an old barn and outbuildings that would be on property of Windsor Court. And that would be connected to number four, the Jones family home on Madison Avenue. Number three, of course, would represent where the Melton Junction Cemetery is. Part of the, the land that makes up Windsor Court and also um, the properties of Windsor Court are part of the James Brannan edition and also parts of Outlot 104 on the plat maps. In the deed of abstract that I have with our house, um, there's a lot of entries of, you know, the, the ownership of land through the years. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was interesting that um, the United States granted 160 acres to Henry B.B. Crandall in 1843. And I'm thinking that the land that makes up Windsor Court was at one time part of those 160 acres. And of course, through the years, um, land would be divided off and sold to different people. And in the that bottom in the, where the red dot is, in the description, it says, United States to Henry B.B. Crandall grants the Northeast quarter of section 28 in Township 4 North of range 13 East. So I'm not positive, but I think the land of Windsor Court was one time part of that 160 acres given to Henry Crandall from the government. And also, it states that Henry Crandall sold land to Seeley Monroe in 1859. And then Seeley Monroe would then sell land to a Morris Pratt, which his name is shown on the 1873 plat map 
Of course, there's no indication of a street at all at that point, but the little cross, you would see where it indicates the um, Junction Cemetery. There's like the little cross. Right yep, mm -hmm. that would indicate the Junction Cemetery. I do want to say all these slides that mom has, I'm going to have up as a PDF uploaded to our website too, so you'll be able to read everything too. And then also in 1880, it says Morris Pratt and his wife Mary sold land to Henry Williams. And you can see at that point, there is an indication of a street with another street branching off to the west of that. And then of course, indicating the Junction Cemetery in that area as well. In 1904, Henry Williams also sold, well, excuse me, from the plat map of 1904, it shows Windsor Street with West Street branching off, and of course, that area part of the James Branham addition. In 1943, Eloise Eloise Williams and a Helen Grau would sell land to Jesse and Nina Babcock they in turn would sell land to the Junction Cemetery. And I think it's interesting to note in reference to the cemetery, it says Articles of Association dated February 7, 1871. Adult citizens of Melton Junction, Rock County, Wisconsin, met on February 6, 1871 for the purpose of forming a cemetery association. Corporate name shall be Melton Junction Cemetery Association. And you'll see in a, another slide that potentially shows where that land was sold to the Junction Cemetery. Also, the James Brannan's edition, this kind of indicates from 1888 that James Brannan sold, looks like land to Melton Junction. I don't know for sure if this is kind of like the start of the developing of Windsor Court, but um, some of the properties of Windsor Court are part of the James Granham addition. This is a 1970, excuse me, 1937 aerial map of Windsor Court. And you can see right there is Windsor Court, the end of Windsor Court, obviously, all kinds of farmland surrounding it. And you can see where the old barn and outbuilding is. Here. Mm -hmm. And then right over to the right of that is the Junction Cemetery. Yeah. That street, um, well, that road to the cemetery is what comes off, it goes into the cemetery off Madison Avenue. And then on the other, from the other corner is where it comes off onto John Paul Road. And you can see in this picture, it is just definitely all farmland to the left of that cemetery um, road right there. Here's an aerial comparison of that 37 um, picture and then also an aerial of 2020. A represents the access road that in 37, of course, was not um, put in at that time. And then A in the other picture represents the access road that four of us neighbors use. B represents the old barn that was um, there on that property, which is, I believe was associated with the um, family that, the house that lives, the house that the Jones family lives in right now. And then also in B, in the, the more recent photo is where my neighbor Bob and Diane Kenyon live right now, but that's also the house that her parents, Larry and Elaine Ingalls, um, built. And when they were building, getting ready to build the house, they had the land, um, they were getting the land ready. And these are just different artifacts that um, they found getting the, the land ready for them to build their house. Um, we have a <clears throat> railroad tie, of course, the railroad tracks was about a block away, you know, from where that, you know, the land is, an old um, nail head, a few arrowheads, a bottle of old screws, 
It looks like a couple medicine bottles, an old coat hook, one of quite a few horseshoes. Larry and Elaine also um, put horseshoes above their doorways at, at the house. And Diane said that um, Larry found a big um, grinding wheel that they actually had cemented in the front step by their porch. And this, um, I thought was quite interesting. I thought it was something maybe to do with animals or something, you know, with it being a farm and everything else. We'll come to find out it's a glass coffee filter <laughs> and from the Cory coffee maker. And also, um, when the Wright family lived on Madison Avenue, in their backyard, um, there was a picture of, looks like the one of the old outbuildings. You can kind of see it in the back, kind of like with a white stripe thing on it. Yeah, mm -hmm. So it looks like, the, and it was um, potentially from the late 40s and the early 50s. So I'm not sure if that was the only building at that time that was in the back there, but I'd also like to make a mention that on the other side of the Wright family backyard, kind of like on the other side of where that bush is, that's where when we, us kids were growing up like in the 60s, 70s, um, they installed a ball diamond for us neighborhood kids to play on. There are currently 10 houses on Windsor Court. And according to my one neighbor, Jack and Connie, they um, were told by Bob Willett, who lived at one time at 17 Windsor Court, that their house was moved to the street, that it wasn't built on the street. So I don't know where that house originally, you know, sat or anything. And then of course, um, before the city's merge, when we were part of Melton Junction, our addresses had different house numbers. So one Windsor Court became 17 Windsor Court, two Windsor Court changed to 16 Windsor Court, three Windsor Court built in what I found, it looks like they was built in 1900, that changed to 23 Windsor Court, and I find it kind of interesting that there were three neighbors that lived at 23 Windsor Court who appeared to have led a double life on Windsor Court. Larry and Elaine Ingalls lived there when it was three Windsor Court and they would eventually um, buy a chunk of land from the Haldiel family and build their house where all the artifacts were found and that would become 36 Windsor Court then Randy and Judy Itry would live at 23 Windsor Court. They as well would buy land from the Haldiel family and they would build their house up in the back corner of 40 Windsor Court. And then of course, Danny Zimmerman, who grew up with his family on the corner of Madison Avenue and Windsor Court, when him and his wife Connie got married, they would live at 23 Windsor Court for a number of years with their two kids. And of course, four Windsor Court became 22 Windsor Court, five Windsor Court changed to 33 Windsor Court, and rumor has it that that house was at one time a gas station, with the front, front entry being where the backyard is, or where their back door is. Six Windsor Court changes over to 30 Windsor Court, eight Windsor Court becomes 52 Windsor Court, and the house where I grew up, we actually had the address of 2 West Street when um, we moved into the house and we got changed over to 34. And of course, 36 and 40 were built after the merger, so they always had just that one house number. And here's a little um, <clears throat> piece of my younger sister's birth certificate where it indicates that our address was 2 West Street in Melton Junction, 
And then also you can see where that West Street was supposed to branch off from the end of Windsor Street. And you can see where on this map where the street actually was a straight street, but our street actually has that bend in it. And then the pink just indicates the portion of land that my parents um, purchased as part of the outlot 104. I'm trying to get my bearings. Um, where is the, um, we'll say the quick trip on this, on this photo. Is that showing on there? Um, <clears throat> I don't know if you recall in the first slide where I had mentioned that the former insurance office was right. in the background of the picture. Quick trip would be right on across the, the right across the yeah. street. Okay. I have so many mm -hmm. And supposedly at one time, Windsor Court was proposed to be a cul-de-sac and not just a dead end street. And in the pink is a property um, that um, my parents bought. And it looks like the cul-de-sac was supposed to, the street was supposed to go continue on in front of our house and then come up as a cul-de-sac, um, come up south and facing Madison Avenue and with potential of a couple other houses being put in. And then of course Madison Avenue would be down on the bottom of that um, map area right there. Of course the cul-de-sac never developed. It always remained a dead end street. In a couple of old phone directories that I have from 1939 and 1942, there were a few people living on Windsor Court. Card Com 1 lived at 1 Windsor Court, now 17 Windsor Court, and you can see in the enlarged version where his phone number was 1104. And M.J. Burkhart lived at 2 Windsor Court, now 16 Windsor Court. And the Wesley M. Nelson lived at 4 Windsor Court. It looks like if you lived on Windsor Court, the first three digits of your phone number was 110, and the last digit was whatever your house number was. And also using my Melton Public Library card, I was able to access online old um, newspaper articles that pertain to people or even whatever events that um, happened on Windsor Court through the years. And the Mr. and Mrs. Paskey was one of my neighbors living on the street when I was growing up. Arlene worked for many years at the Farmer's Bank. And then Bart D'Angelo also was one of my neighbors growing up on the street. Her nickname was Bubbles. And then in 1950, it says Mr. and Mrs. Fern Field and children moved Saturday on to Windsor Court. We, our house is directly right behind Fernie and Arlene's um, house. And this is of course where Jody lives in that house currently. And Fernie and Arlene lived there with their kids, Karen, David, and Nancy. And then also, Ms. Mr. and Mrs. William Howland moved into their house in 1957. Bill Howland was my father's boss at the Barber Coleman Company over on Vincent Street near the Melton Junction Grade School. And him and his wife, Jeanette, are the ones that sold my parents their piece of land. And then, of course, after the Howland family um, moved away, the Deal family moved into the house for many years. There are a number, quite a number of people that have lived in Windsor Court through the years since I moved in there in 1959. And these are just some of the families that lived on Windsor Court through the years. There's the Ash family, Hilton, Ingalls, McAfee, Schmidt, Dewey, Axelson, Deal, Itchery, Stowers, Adams, Brock, Willett, Donnie Zimmerman, David Samuelson, Forrest Samuelson, Mitchell Fanning, D'Angelo, Howland, Paskey, Kenyon, William Fanning, Rob, Johnston Fanning, Stanelli, Cervantes, Field, Nelson, James, Baker, and Kunkel.
and also our neighborhood wouldn't be complete if we didn't mention some of our Ma or Madison Avenue neighbors that helped make up the neighborhood as well. And some of those neighbors that lived up on the Madison Avenue through the years were Chatfield, <coughs> the tenants of the brick apartment building on the corner of Madison Avenue and Windsor Court. And then at 432 West Madison Avenue was the Antisdal family, Lyle Zimmerman family, Bedwell and Fiddler families. And then at 426 West Madison were the Fish, Tilton and Shoal families. And then in the greenhouse next to that were McMillan and the Diva Squally family. And beyond that, the Barry, Dennis James. Then we have the Wright family, Kempinen family, and Welch family, and then the Jones family. Also, one of my neighbors had his own business on Windsor Court. Tom Robb had his own upholstery business. And in the 1963 Courier, it says Tom Robb starts upholstery service. Tom Robb, Melton Junction, who has been employed by Union Furniture Jefferson for the past 27 years, announces this week that he is starting a full-time upholstery service here. He is operating a shop at his home on a full-time basis. When my neighbor Jack, or when my neighbor Jack and Connie Adams moved into the house, they found Tom's upholstery sign in their garage and had donated it to the Melton House Museum. So the Melton House Museum was gracious enough to let me borrow that for the presentation. And you can see where Tom had the tr sign hung on one of his front trees in the front yard. And then a few years ago, Jack and Connie had the one car garage and Tom's workshop demolished to build themselves a larger garage. But you can see the double door um, where Tom would have been able to move larger pieces of furniture in and out. And then that just is the back side of what used to be Tom's um, upholstery shop. In the 1963 Courier, there's a couple ads for Tom had about his business. You can see the addresses at that time for Windsor Court. <coughs> and uh, also he had a holiday um, ad as well. The chair in the middle belonged to my mother-in-law, Jean Kunkel, and she said that Tom had upholstered that chair for her. And another event that happened on our house was unfortunately, our house had a house fire back in 72, so it doesn't seem like it's been 50 years ago. It did happen on a Friday night. My brother was on the varsity basketball team. They had an away game, and of course my mom and dad were um, had gone to that ball game that night. My older sister was babysitting on the other end of town, and I had been babysitting and had taken my little sister with me. And at that time, we didn't have any um, family pets at all in the house. But if you can have, if you can see at all in the in background of the picture, that's where I was babysitting that night at my aunt and uncle, Dick and Janice Petrix. And of course, that's the fire station at that time was right across the street from my aunt and uncles. And I recall we would always, if you heard the whistle, you always went to the window, looked outside, what direction are the fire trucks gonna be going? Of course, that night we see them head down First Street toward Madison Avenue. Now, whether anybody paid attention where they went or not, it's really hard to say. But I do recall many, many, many phone calls coming into my aunt and uncle's house that night, telling about the house fire, and you know they wanted to leave a message. Of course, a lot of them didn't know that I was the one that was answering the phone. And luckily, um, in, you know, after a while, the neighbors did find out that nobody was in the house. And um, so, and, and the thing is, you know, I knew where everyone was. I knew where all my family members were, but I didn't realize that the neighbors perhaps weren't aware of that at that time. And here's some pictures of some of the fire department working on the fire, and then of course afterwards. And this is a thank you note that my parents put in that week's edition of the Courier. And this just kind of shows the house, 
Cohen um, was that spring or summer, I believe, of that year. Also, living down on Windsor Court when we were growing up, you looked, you felt like you were living in the country, even though you're only a block and a half away from Merchant Road, where all the stores <coughs> were. This is my sis, my older sister and brother, and they're um, in our front yard. Um, and you could see that obviously there was no houses and stuff back there. That little house in the background, I believe, is the Stockman family home out on Cerns Road. And for many years, um, right in the back, I'm not sure what if there was any crop in there or not, but for, for many years, um, the Hell Deal family would rent land to the Melton FFA and they would grow corn crops for many years in that area. And Mush Gandy, who used to corn crop, or excuse me, crop dust the corn crop, um, would come in and whether he was doing it on purpose or not, but many days he would be flying so low, us kids would go screaming into the house and we thought he was gonna crash into us. <laughs> And here's another view um, looking north um, from our front yard and, or my neighbor's yard. And back in the early 60s, before all those trees actually grew up, that's where the train tracks went out of Melton. You could stand on our front porch, hear the whistle, go look for the smokestack, and you could watch the train coming into Melton or leaving Melton. And a lot of times you could even see somebody standing in the caboose at the very end. And here's um, a picture in 1986 before 40 Windsor Court was built. And you could see oh, on the other side of the tree line and on the other side of that utility pole is what would eventually become Luca subdivision. And then here's in the 87, the Itri family <coughs> is in the process of having their house built. And then of course, there's still no development of Lucas subdivision. And you can see the Stockman family still in the photo. And here's another um, picture looking north before Lucas subdivision was put in. How did it go sledding there in the winter? A lot of sledding, <laughs> yes. And this is how the front yard, looking out the front yard looks now. And over here on the right, I mean, you can kind of see there's kind of like a little bit of a yellowish or cream color house. And here's just a little bit closer up version just on the back side of my neighbor's lean to, you can see different houses on Lucas Lane. Also, some of our properties on Windsor Court are zoned agriculture. So they can either have various farm animals or they can also grow crops. One of my former neighbors, Pam Brock and her husband, Ken, they had different farm animals. They had a, they had a sheep, a few horses. One of the horses name was Hank. And they also had a goat that liked to come over and check out the bridal wreath in our front yard at different times. And then another neighbor, Thorin Burgett, Samuelson, they also had a few horses and there's one of their horses in their yard. And also um, the Hale Deal family had a number of animals through the years growing up. Hale, of course, was a local veterinarian in town. Um, Doc Deal, as he was referred to by many, um, took care of a number of pets with his veterinary care, as well as having a number of um, farm, you know, pets and stuff for the family. Um, I'd like to read um, one thing that Beth sent over. We once watched a dog that belonged to the Chicago Cubs owner. He remarked that it was worth the drive because Dad was the only one he trusted to take care of all his to, to take care of his dog while he was away. And also another fun event that happened on Windsor Court was an MD carnival that took place in the early 60s. And a little bit of the backstory is that the Deal family knew the Carey family who had a son, Tommy, who had muscular dystrophy and was confined to a wheelchair. 
the deal girls wanted to know what they could do to help raise money somehow to give to the Carey family in order to make Tommy's life a little bit easier. So the idea was to come up with an MD carnival, Vicki, one of her sisters, Lori, and a good friend of theirs, Ruth Holgum, were instrumental in getting the carnival in place. And here's, um, picture from the 1962 carnival, some of the kids that were helping out on the carnival. In the lower right hand, in the lower right hand corner, or the, excuse me, the left hand corner, the girl in the, like the white shirt, that's Sally McGuire. Sally lived on Madison Avenue next to the Jones family. Then in the middle is Nancy Field, one of the Windsor Court neighbors. And then Janet Hilton, she lived next to Sally at that time on Madison Avenue. And down the road, her parents, Hork and Verge Hilton, would buy one of the houses on Windsor Court. In the back row is Bob Willett. And on the other side is his sister, Virginia, one of their Windsor Court neighbors. Then Diane Ingalls lived next to the Willett family. And then there's Bruce Shaw. His family lived on 2nd Street when we were growing up. And then also here's a picture of the um, neighborhood and the helpers from the 63 Carnival. I don't recognize a lot of the people, but I think I'm in the lower right-hand corner. And then Nancy Field is in the back corner, kind of like right in front of the, looks like the, was it the, the door, the door, the window, or the garage, or something. Oh, that's the kitchen window. Was it the kitchen window? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then a couple articles that we'll be able to view online. And and also, um, there were a number of people and businesses that contributed um, to the carnival. You know, with different prizes and things like that. I do remember playing a game where I won a little angel statue, a white angel with gold trimming. But I like to read this. I thought this was quite interesting that Vicki um, submitted to me. But the best donation story was that of the Wrigley Company. One afternoon, a huge truck rolled down the driveway carrying an entire load of Wrigley's chewing gum. I don't know what event they thought they were supporting, but there was enough gum for the whole county. There were so many cases, the pallets were stacked in the garage, practically filling it. Mom didn't know what else to do with it. Dad came home, opened the garage to park his truck, and was rather surprised. Everyone at the carnival received gum, and afterwards, so did many others in Melton. It's true. Shout out to Dennis. And then, and then also, with the um, presentation being here at the library, I'd like to read a uh, Windsor Court memory that Beth um, submitted. I can't believe I left out an important Windsor Court memory seeing that your daughter is involved <coughs> with the library. Debbie Kaler and I created our own library and called it the Junior Center. Mother was such a strong advocate for reading, so we had a huge collection of wonderful children's books. It only made sense to share them with other, with other neighborhood children. We taped slips of paper in the front of each book and left spaces for signing and due dates. We even made a list of appropriate library behavior, <laughs> rules, and a fine schedule. We had the Happy Hollister, Nancy Drew, and Bobsy Twin series, plus tons of paperback readers from Scholastic and Willie Well book clubs from school. Also available were craft supplies, games, and puzzles. I think the Zimmermans were our first customers. I had sent letters to different companies asking if they wished to donate an item to our library and received a response that we still laugh about today. The envelope was addressed to the parents of Junior Center. They thought my first name was Junior and my last name Center. <laughs> And these are just some um, Windsor Court memories from some of my former Windsor Court neighbors. And again, you know, they'll be able to view online and 
with the PDF. And also a lot of things that kids did on Windsor Court was a lot of artwork was drawn on the mini sidewalks of Windsor Court. Tons of um, bikes were ridden up and down the street through the years, as well as roller skating. And this is Ashley roller skating in her tutu down Windsor Court. <laughs> And also many games, ball games were played either up at the Zimmermans in their basketball, in their driveway, basketball hoop in their driveway, and then games of kickball four square were played in the street. And we also did a lot of sledding. If the conditions were right, we would go sliding, sledding down the street itself, but many days were spent in the deal's backyard, sledding down the hills. Another fun event that we did on Windsor Court was for 20 some years, we had an annual block party. Elaine Ingalls was the one that took the pictures of the block parties, put them in the different photo albums, and they came every year to the different block parties. And this was on the inside cover of Elaine's first photo album that she put together. Annual Windsor Court Party, first one held on Sunday, August 26, 1979 at the home of Larry and Elaine Ingalls with Cork and Bridge Hilton as co-host, the best street in Milton. <laughs> and then every year, two families co-hosted the block party. They provided the meat for sandwiches, offered coffee, tea, lemonade, punch. Then everyone would bring their drink of choice as well as a dish to pass and a dessert. And one of the block parties, one of the neighbors brought a bakery cake decorated welcome to Windsor Court. And then if needed, the guys went around to the other neighbor houses and grabbed up the picnic tables for the block party. And this is for the from the first block party that was held. Um, that's Bob Willett, Larry Ingalls on the tractor, and then Cork Hilton. And then here's a few of the Black Party invitations, and then there's also some more up here on the table. We also um, formed a Yuka tournament at one of our Black Parties, the first one held in 1982. And here you can see on the table are the trophies. Whoever had the highest score of the Yuka tournament that year got to take the Grand Championship Trophy home, and then the, whoever had the lowest score got the booby prize for the next year. <laughs> and of course, Hale Deal and Elaine Ingalls were tied that year, I believe, for the championship trophy for the first year. Here are a number of um, the high score winners um, through the years. Um, in 87, it looks like four of us um, tied for the top score of the tournament that year. And then here are just some of um, the um, different people through the years. And I can have Ashley point to, to them and be up in that one corner, be Cork Hilton, Aura Zimmerman and Randy Itchery. Then over here on the top is Elaine and Lee Kunkel. My dad. Your dad. <laughs> and then in the bottom middle is Elaine and Virg Hilton. And then there's um, Dave Dewey's son and Randy Entry. And then here's some more. The one up there with the um, tank top, that um, Dave Dewey next to Elaine Ingalls. And then in the in the middle is Lee and Beth Itchery. And then and the other picture on the right side is Randy Itchery, Lyle Zimmerman, myself, and Grace Rob. And then on the bottom is that's myself and Orme Zimmerman. In the middle, Grace Rob, Randy Itchery. And then it shows um, Bird Hilton and Dolores Deal. And these are just kind of some random snapshots of um, the 
different block parties through the years. And in the middle, that's Ashley at her first block party in 86. Oh. Then right over here is Elaine Ingalls, Virg Hilton, Grace Robb. Down in the middle here, Arlene Paskey, Barb D'Angelo, and Elizabeth Chatfield. Mrs. Chatfield was my kindergarten teacher. And then in the bottom row, yep, there's Jack and Connie Adams. And the lady in the white shirt like is Arlene Field. In the pink shirt is Birgit Samuelson. Then over here in this corner is Bob Willett, Cork Hilton, Elizabeth Chatfield, Elaine Ingalls, Grace Robb, Larry Ingalls, and Tom Robb. And then up in that one corner is Donnie Zimmerman and his two kids, Danielle and Derek. Then in the striped shirt is Jack Adams and his wife, Connie. In the lower corner over here is Donnie and Schmidt and Dave Dewey. And then over in the corner, we got Lyle Zimmerman, Bob Willett, Lorraine Willett, Orme Zimmerman, and Virg Hilton. Ashley and Danielle Zimmerman when they were younger. And you can see in the corner right here, we had the block party that year up at the top of the street at Lyle and Orme Zimmerman's house. The other thing I'd like to touch on was there were a couple huge ash trees, or excuse me, a couple big trees or unique trees I felt was on Windsor Court. <clears throat> Jack and Connie Adams unfortunately had to have a huge ash tree taken down a couple years ago because of the emerald ash borer. They figured it was at least 150 years old. And I'd like to think that that was part of those trees that were indicated in that first illustrated plat map of 1881. This is when Jack and Connie had to take their down, had to take the ash tree down. You can see how massive it was in the, the one picture of how big, you know, how wide it was. And then the lower picture is the last limb of the tree before that was cut down. Also, I thought it was a new, unique tree that we have in our front yard is a tulip tree. The um, tulip tree is a native, is the state tree of Indiana so I have no idea how my parents got the tree in the first place. It's at least 60 years old um, now. And you can see where the tree has been split in half. This is a leaf from the tulip tree. Not all of them get this big, but this happened to be that year. Um, I found a couple large tulip trees, or tulip leaf trees tulip tree leaves in the yard. And you can see um, another leaf in comparison to a penny. And they also get like little flowers on the top of the tree. And that shows like in the spring and summertime. And then the lower picture are the dried up flower pods in the wintertime. You don't want to be walking around a tulip tree with your bare feet because those flower pods are very sharp and awfully hard. And if anybody's never really seen a tulip tree leaf, all you need to do is go out here on the terrace of the library by the library sign. The city planted a tulip tree about three, four years ago. And then also, not only did things happen on top of Windsor Court, there's things that took place underneath Windsor Court, such as where the sewer lines and such are. And from a 1939 journal that indicates Windsor Place, it shows the position of the sewer lines for the different residences. And also from a 1961 um, article from the Gazette, it states contract to Edgerton firm FP&T Construction Company Edgerton was awarded the contract to install curb, gutter, and storm sewer on Elm Street in Windsor Court by the Melton Junction Village Board. Approximate cost is $8,500 and work is 
is expected to start in a week. A few years ago, um, the street had to be torn up again to replace the water main and the laterals going to the homes and probably safe to say that it was slightly more than $8,500 at this time. So here are a few pictures of when we had, a, um, had the street torn up. And of course, at that time, all of us neighbors had to park our vehicles elsewhere if we needed to use them. And we finally got a fire hydrant on the street after who knows how many years. And that's installed by the group of mailboxes. And the street is getting ready to be repaved after all the work has been completed. Some of the crew smoothing out the asphalt at the end of the street. And here's a view of the street looking from Madison Avenue down to the end of the street. Of course, there's um, our house, 36 Windsor Court and 40 Windsor Court that aren't in the picture. And then there's a view of the street looking from the bottom of Windsor Court up back toward Madison Avenue. And that brings a conclusion to our presentation, but I'd like to thank the following people for contributing either the artifacts to show, memories, and also pictures um, for the presentation. And those people are Debbie Ash Ama, Diane Marie Ash, Pam Brock, Beth Deal Benson, Vicki Deal Fish, Nancy Field Calf, Diane Ingalls Kenyon, Melton DPW, Melton House Museum, Melton Public Library, and Barb Bright Lofton. And I'd like to thank all of you guys for coming and taking this journey with me down Windsor Court. <laughs> <laughs>